and I keep, I keep trying to grow up as tall as he is. Oh, come on up here. Pastor Peter. You got something to say, brother? <clears throat> Hallelujah. Well, glory to God. I am uh, I'm now a great-grandfather in the natural and in the spiritual. I'm a grandfather, and I'm a father. You know, I, I, I like my, my, my grandkids. I've got 13 grandbabies, one great-grand. And what's good about grandbabies is you get to have them over and you stuff them full of sugar and <laughs> give them donuts, give them candy, love them, and send them home. <laughs> Uh, let me pray. Father, all honor and all glory and all majesty to you. Father, I, I thank you that you meet the needs of the people this morning. I humbly submit myself to you to be used as a vessel, Lord, to minister to the people. Let me say the right thing at the right time in the right manner, Lord, to bring an increase in faith and an increase in grace, Lord. I bless you, Lord. I can't say enough about you, Lord, that would be wonderful enough to even come near to the things that my heart would like to say, Lord. But Lord, I bless you this morning and I give you all the honor and the glory and the praise. And I thank you for blessing the people in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. amen. Hallelujah. I, I, I want you to pay attention to the things that I say this morning. Uh, I don't want you working on your cell phone unless you're reading your Bible off your cell phone. Uh, no, no, no candy crush sagas. and well, you, you, You'll be surprised the things that go on in churches anymore. And I'm going to start this way. The scripture says, now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field that the Lord God had made. And that's what has happened to not just our churches, but to our society. We have been so distracted in what is important and what is not important. Uh, we haven't learned simple truths that apply to natural life and apply to your spiritual life because we're so busy separating ourselves rather than coming together. You know, we're not supposed to be a people where one of us is suffering while everybody else goes merrily on their way. You know, when one is left, we should find out, uh, well, why is that one still here? I have a policy, and I'm sure it comes from the military. I'm a former military man. Uh, no man left behind. We, we, we don't leave people in the parking lot. We don't, we don't leave our women victims in the parking lot or our men victims with a flat tire or something. Somebody has to take time and neither should we be leaving one another spiritually. Neither should we be leaving one another hurting. You know, uh, uh, we, we know there's gifts of the spirit. We know there's the discerning of spirits. You know, it's not suspicion I'm talking about, but discerning of spirits, but there's common sense too. You can look at somebody's eyes and see, listen, this person is hurting. Why are they hurting and what is my part to eliminate that hurt? You have a part. So many things are, are forgotten today and uh, I'm not preaching my message yet. This is called my miscellaneous ramblings, okay? <laughs> But it, it's important ramblings. Uh, as I was praying, the Lord said the word to me, bookstore. And then he said, Bible bookstore. Well, you know, words are so important because words create pictures in our heart and on the tables of our heart. So, such as if I say dog, you'll see your dog. But if I say big dog, you may not see your dog because your dog is not big. But if I say big brown dog, well, that could focus on your brother's dog. But if I say little dog, that eliminated that and you see some guy down the block. See? But if I say short dog, 
You may see an animal or you may see a container. So it all creates a picture on the inside of you. Now, when God said to me, bookstore, immediately I saw a store with books. But then he said, Bible bookstore. Well, that shifted from bookstore because it didn't have the business section in it anymore. As far as worldly business, it had godly business section. But then he said, one wall contains your Bibles. The rest of the store is what is written about the one wall. I went, oh my, I never thought about that, Lord. He says, do you know why? I said, I never thought about that either. He said, I'll explain why. The Bible, the words in the Bible are the words of God, spiritually breathed. And what they do is they feed your spirit, man, when your spirit is alive to the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what that one little wall does. The rest of it feeds your mind. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. When you read from the little wall, you get it faster than when you read about the little wall. Okay? Because when it gets into your soulish realm, you got to kind of get it around and get it around. And depending on what you know and what you've been taught and how well you listen to Pastor Don, you can get it down into your spirit where it'll generate faith. So these are the things that God's been telling me. You know, God's been showing me so many things about these last days. But yet, we have to always remember that first verse that says, the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field that the Lord God had made. The serpent will always use anything he can to get your mind off of what God is doing. The Bible says, where sin does the abound, grace even much more abounds. Well, you know what? The way I understand that, grace is abounding. Not if you listen to the TV. Grace is much more abounding. Not if you listen to the TV. You think the devil is running roughshod and everybody and the whole thing's going down the tubes. It's a lie. The scripture says in John 10, 10, it's the thief, not a thief, the thief that comes not but for to steal. He didn't come to kill. He came to steal. Did you hear me? See, most preachers misquote that. They say he came to kill, steal, and destroy. No, he came to steal first, then to kill and destroy. Well, I don't see why it makes a lot of difference. It does. You know why? When killer walks into the room. Hey, there's Killer, man. I want to be like Killer. You know, Killer's cool. Look at him. You check out that shirt, man. Look at him shoes. You see the way he's... Yeah, he struts. That's Killer. Whereas when Thief walks in, everybody gets... Get away from him, man. Shoot, he'll take your watch. He'll take your ring. Don't let him get close, man. He'll steal the hair off your head. You don't want nothing to do with him. So the devil wants himself to be Killer. But you know what he is? He's a thief. And what he is doing is he's stealing from not God's people. He's stealing from all people. How is he stealing? First thing he wants to do is he wants to steal your mind. He wants you to be unclear in mind. He wants to steal your identity. He wants to steal your love. He wants to steal your children. He wants to buckle you under. And you know what? We're letting him do it because he's subtle. He got our eyes focused on here. He got our eyes focused on here. You know, as a kid, I was wondering, how would people ever see Jesus when he returns? He said, every eye will see him. How could that be? It's because they're going to all be looking at their cell phones. (laughs) <laughs> we, and, and you know you, you think they can't do nothing with your cell phone my cell phone kept going off and I finally got it and said what is it says there's a big tornado that was coming from Palm Springs through San Bernardino and this is a emergency alert 
I said, well, I tell you what, when Jesus shows up, it's going to be an emergency alert all over the world. <laughs> and every, every eye will see him. The enemy has thus removed us from where we're supposed to be. You know, I've been in church a, a while. Uh, I had a drug problem. My mother drug me to church every week. I got saved when I was seven years old, and next month I'll be 71, so that way you won't have to wonder. Been a long time. But the good thing is I've seen a lot. I've come through a, a, a lot of uh, evolutions. I've seen a whole lot of growth, a whole lot of misgrowth, you know. I, I, I watch me grow. You know, I was a Negro. My knees were growing. <laughs> they did too. Yeah. Yeah. Then I was black, but that brought confusion. Then I was African-American, but I'd never been to Africa. <laughs> I've been to China. And the devil had my mind on all of these things. You know, I, I come through the 60s. I come through the hippies. You know, when I, when, when I left Mississippi, I was so glad to get out of there. But what I had plans to do was I was going to get me a, a motorcycle. I was going to get a BSA. And I was going to have a surfboard behind it. And I was going to ride to California. <laughs> and I had grew my hair long. So it would be flinging back. <laughs> you know. It says, God has the hairs on your heads numbered. I'm glad he knows where mine are. <laughs> I don't, but it's okay. Less to toil with. I had that great idea, but something happened, and I took a plane. I got that BSA, but it wouldn't start. I finally got it, but I, I, it wouldn't start, so I just kept it, finally got rid of it. Never could stand up on a surfboard, so I got married. That was 50 years ago. I'm still married. But there's distractions on your intent, Come on now. okay? But now here's the interesting thing. There's distractions on God's intent for you. Maybe I am getting to my message, huh? There's distractions. The devil wants you to go this way when God wants you to go this way. You know, I, I, I think it was a very famous, I, I, think, I think it was Mark Twain. I'm not positive, but I think it was Mark Twain. He said, if you know about Jesus, you have nothing. I'll say that again. He said, if you know about Jesus, you have nothing. If you know Jesus, you have everything. The devil wants you to know about him. He just don't want you to know him. And every time someone gets near to knowing him, they'll get distracted. Why, they dropped a bomb in Timbuktu. They're looking for an airplane that went down in, I don't even know what it is. I got a book of maps. I don't even know what page it's on. There's fighting in, an earthquake erupted in, this happened, that. and then they won't tell you the truth. I, I'll give you a little fact that you may not know. When I was a little boy, the church I went to, they had missionaries to Haiti, the island of Haiti. But see, people don't understand half of the island, right down the middle, is the Dominican Republic. Well, this side, the Dominican side, are Christians. 
born again, many, many spirit-filled, loving Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. The other side, the Haiti side, well, voodoo. Voodoo. No, 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 no. They talk to each other all night with the drums and all of that kind of stuff. They uh, uh, had portions and they burned feathers and burned parts and stuck needles and dolls and all of that. And that became the national religion of Haiti. You know what God did about it? Nothing. He just let it. Just let it. Just let it. You would fly into the airport in Haiti and you'd see all of the voodoo dolls and everything on the wall and the pictures of the witch doctors and all of that. Suddenly, I love suddenly, an earthquake hit. Shocking. Come down the middle of the voodoo center. Opened the ground up and swallowed up 250,000 of them. CNN didn't tell you that, did they? Closed up. You go in the airport in Haiti now, you won't see nothing about voodoo. In the meantime, an island, the people in the Dominican Republic, they weren't even affected by it. It didn't bother them a bit. Why God's protection? Do you know God is protecting his people? God has his hand on you. You know, things that happen, uh, uh, they just give you a little 20-second blurb just to get your mind off of what's going on. But let me tell you something more recent. Earthquake hit in Big Bear. Everybody know where Big Bear is? The ground split coming from the west. Went up to a church and stopped. Turned south. Went to the back of the church. Turned east. This is the splitting ground now. Turned north. Turned east. Tore up everything on both sides of the church. The church up there was fine. They said, when they spirit still, I don't know. But hey, God knew them. The news media didn't report that. You know, you talk about all of the, the things that are happening today. Well, do you think God really does miracles today? Well, the scripture says Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. Didn't say he varies. You know, I grew up when my, my biggies in life were sitting in front of the TV on Saturday morning. Not watching cartoons, but waiting for A.A. A. Allen to come on. Waiting for Oral Roberts to come on to watch those miracles. I was just a little boy. I don't even know what I was sitting on. I think I was sitting on a milk crate. Because we had a whole lot of furniture. Oh, but that thing got in my heart. Twelve years old. At an A.A. A. Allen meeting. I was in the balcony. And the reason I was in the balcony is because they didn't let the black people mix with the white people on the bottom floor. And see, it always troubled me. Why would they want the white people on the bottom floor when they're closer to hell and we up here closer to God? It should have been the other way. But I was just a little boy. So Brother Allen was ministering to this. Well, actually, he was praying. He, he, I mean, he, he had hands laid on. He was beating her up, man. It was something else. And, 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 and I, I tapped my mama. I said, Mama. Mama. She said, what, what, what? I said, Mama, Mama, Mama. She said, what? I said, I'm going to be just like Brother Allen one day. She said, okay, okay. <laughs> Time passes. Time goes by. 2006, I was in a meeting in Ontario, California with R.W. Schambach, who was A.A. A. Allen's morning and afternoon minister. He would explain how to operate in faith, like it's something new now, you know, but he was explaining it back then. 
and teaching the people how to build up their faith so when Brother Allen would come, the Spirit of God could use him to lay hands on him and drive out sickness, drive out devils, drive out demons, break the powers that bind people. And I was in a room with him and I said, Brother Schambach, I said, I need to ask you a question. He said, okay, son. He was 85 at the time. 2006, a little while back, I guess I was about 10 years younger, so I was still old as far as some of you look at me. <laughs> but uh, I said, I need to take you back. He says, well, how far back? I said, to 1956. He said, great, Google Mugga, son. He said, that's 50 years. He said, okay, go ahead, what's up? I said, I received my calling to the ministry in an A.A. A. Allen meeting. I said, and you were there. I said, but you were a little more rotund <laughs> than, than you are now. He laughed. He said, well, where was the meeting? I said, it was in Queens, New York. He said, Brooklyn Academy of Music. I said, what? He says, that's where the meeting was held, Brooklyn Academy of Music. I looked at him, because I hadn't asked him that question yet. He says, you know, son, I have always wondered why that meeting was significant. He said, I'm going to tell you what happened. He said, during that morning meeting, a lady came, lady came to me after service, and she said, Brother Schombach, I need you to give this envelope to Brother Allen for me. He said, I don't know what's in the envelope. She said, $2,500 in $100 bills. He said, son, in 56, he said, that was like somebody walking up to you and handing you between 50 and 75,000 in cash. He said, that was a biggie. He said, well, how come now? She said, because I understand I'm going to die and I don't want to die without paying my tithes. He said, okay. He said, I gave him the envelope. He said, son, I believe that the Lord made that meeting significant 50 years ago so I would be able to tell you this story today. He said, son, I want you to know you're important to God and you carry on what God put in your heart to carry on. And that's why I'm here today. I'm here to help you meet the needs that you have physically, to help you meet the needs of that mental torment, to get rid of those demons that bind you. You know, the church doesn't want to talk about the casting out of devils, you know. We're instructed as disciples to heal the sick, to cleanse the leper. We've never seen a leper. To raise the dead. We scare the dead. And to cast out devils, and churches don't do devils. Well, I got good news for you. I know a couple of churches that do. Hallelujah. 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 My, my dear, come here. God told me he had something special for you. Hallelujah. Now, you tormentors, loose her in Jesus' name. Mm, from this very moment, be loosed and made whole. <laughs> yeah. Glory. Mm. <laughs> my, my. My, my. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Someone is dealing with, I'm going to call it kidney pain. I don't know if it's kidney or what, but it's a problem that you've had right in this area of your body. Where are you at? Okay, it might be more than one. Come on. Hallelujah. God's going to set you free this morning. <laughs> no more. Oh, no more. Hallelujah. Mm. Hallelujah. Shodapasta. Hallelujah. Mm. Hmm. Ha! In Jesus' name, be healed. Pain. Go! In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Be healed. Pain, go. Leave her in Jesus' name. Mm. 
There it is, yeah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Whew. Hallelujah. Now be healed in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Shundara sata. Hallelujah. No more. Hallelujah. I'm going to address traveling pain. It's called a spirit of infirmity. One day your hand don't want to work right, then your shoulder, then your knee is acting up. Next thing you know, it's in your back and it's in your foot. That's called a spirit of infirmity. Where is it? Who has it? Oh, it's many people. Come on, just stand up. Just stand, you don't have to come down. Just stand up for this. I can, I can just, just, just take care of this right now. See, I had that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Huh. Huh. Be healed in Jesus' name, every one of you. Go, you foul spirits of infirmity. You leave. Hallelujah. Hmm. Hmm. Hallelujah. Fear of cancer. You don't have cancer, but you're afraid of it. Where are you at? You have a fear of cancer. Like I say, you don't have it. You have not been diagnosed, but you have a fear of it. Come on. Come on up here. Somebody else. Fear of cancer. Fear of cancer. Anybody else? Fear of cancer. Come on. We Fear of cancer. Fear of cancer. Hallelujah. Shota Karash Darabasata. Hallelujah. 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 You fear of cancer? Come on up here. Huh? Not anymore? <laughs> yeah, in Jesus' name. Be whole. Be made whole. Loose him, you lion devil. You foul spirit. Loose him. God didn't give you a spirit of fear. He gave you power, love, and a sound mind. Hallelujah. Be free. Be free in Jesus' name. Be free in Jesus' name. I want to see this man right here. I want to see you. Come here. Hallelujah. Just stand right here. What's wrong with your leg? Hmm? You're still bothered with your hip. Well, I just cursed that in the name of Jesus. I demanded be healed. Uh, be healed completely. Completely. And I speak to your blood pressure. You got blood pressure problem? I curse this blood pressure. I curse the fear of stroke. I take authority over it now in the name of Jesus. I command you be made whole from the top of your head to the soles of your feet now. Mm. In Jesus' name. Shodabasata. Hallelujah. Bushtakarasata. Blozigi shidodobo soto. Hallelujah. Bad liver. Come on. Bad livers. Come on up here. We're going to turn bad livers to good livers. We want good livers. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Shotaka tapa sata. Now, I'm, I'm going to say something, and I don't mean it to offend, so don't let this offend you. But for the young people, listen to me carefully. Tattoos. In the natural, lead to bad liver. What happens is your body is trying to reject those tattoos, and it's overworking your liver. It's another trick that the devil has put on this generation. Amen. But now, I speak to your livers in the name of Jesus. Jesus, I thank you that you heal these livers now. Be made whole. Change. And I curse fear in Jesus' name. Yeah. Hallelujah. Fear of death. Fear of death. 
Come on. Don't be afraid. Come on. Come on. Don't be embarrassed, please. No. Oh, no. Don't be. This is a biggie. It's very, very common. Come on. Fear of death. I know you're in here. Hey, it ain't me. Yeah, right. <laughs> no, come on. This is the time you get rid of it. And don't come and say, well, Pastor, I'm too embarrassed. That's pride. <laughs> come on. If, if you if you got a fear of death, just come on. This is how you get rid of it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Shota kapa sashtudolado soto. Mambo bobo bobo shita. Zalala shaha. Hingorosho. Orosho, Orosho, Dindada Shata. Hallelujah. Zikorosh, Toro, Koporosho, Koporosho. Hallelujah. We ain't got them all yet. Come on now, it's a, it's a fear of death. You know, it, it, it's not your invention, it's what the devil puts on you. And this is how you get it off by responding. It's not that I'm a bad person because I fear death. No. No, it's what the devil will put on you. Ha ha. Shoka ba sha ta. Danda, 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 danda. I curse fear in Jesus' name. I curse it. Loose her and let her go. Mm -hmm, there it is. Just open your mouth and let it out. Whew. Yeah, 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 there, 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 there. In Jesus' name, be healed. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. If you got to cry, cry. It's okay. In Jesus' name, be healed. No more fear. Loose her now in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Come up this way. Hallelujah. Put your hands up. Put your hands up. In Jesus' name, be healed. Yeah. No more fear of death. I break this thing over your mind now in the name of Jesus. And I command you to be healed. There, yeah. In the name of Jesus, I curse the spirit of death. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, man. Oh, my. You're angry. And you don't know why. You carry an anger. You respond in anger. You're snappy. You do things and say things that you're sorry that you ever didn't said, but nobody's going to believe you because you've always proclaimed that's just you. Anger. I want to see you up front. I've described you. It's mostly guys, but it's some women. You just can't seem to get free of this thing. You've prayed, you've begged, you've pleaded. You've said, Lord, take this from me. God, help me. I don't want to be like this. This is your moment. This is your moment. This is your moment. Hallelujah. You know, I know about this. I had to go through this myself. I used to walk around saying, I'm an angry man. I'm an angry. I think I had been pastoring 15 years. And I used to say that I'm an angry man. No, I wasn't an angry man. I was a man that the devil was working on. Say, I, I renounce anger. In Jesus' name. In Jesus name. 
And when hands are laid on me, when hands are laid on me I'll be free. I'll be free. Be free in Jesus' name. Yeah. Yeah. Say I'm an angry man. I renounce it. I want to be free. When hands are laid on me, I'll be free. Now you spirit of anger, you come out of him in Jesus' name. Loose him and let him go. No more. Be free in Jesus' name. Be free in Jesus' name. Look at me. The devil's a liar. That's not your nature. That's not your nature. That's not your nature. You're a being of love. The scripture says that the love of God is shed abroad in your heart by the Holy Ghost. You have to choose it, though. You have to choose to walk in love. The next time you're ready to snap, rather than snap and say, wait a minute, I'm going to think about this thing. I'm going to walk in love. In Jesus' name, be made whole. Be healed. Loose him, you foul demon of anger. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, be made whole. In Jesus' name, be healed. In Jesus' name, be healed. Yeah, there it is. Totally looser. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Hallelujah. 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 Incidentally, um, it's okay to cry. Uh, particularly, I want to tell the men, it's okay to cry. A lot of men don't realize it's okay to cry because we've been taught that we've got to be tough. Well, that ain't being tough. That's what God put in you to give you an escape. That's your uh, exhaust valve, man. You pull that string and psh, let the pressure out. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Somebody's dying. Who's dying? You know you're dying. That's always a hard one. Nobody wants to admit that. Come on, dear. Come on. You know you're dying. Okay, there's folks here. You got people on hospice. I want you to come. Hospice. You have people on hospice. They're dying. We're dealing with death. You see, our society has become a society of death. Now, you guys may know this. You ladies won't. Uh, you guys have heard of Richard Rawlings, hmm? the car guy, Richard Rawlings. I know the girls haven't. You, oh, well, a couple have. Uh, oh, I, I, I watched him. Grease Monkey Garage. Oh, I watched him. He was just so good. I just really loved the guy until he went boom. And I saw his rings. There were two skulls. Our society is a spirit of death. That's another distraction that the devil has given us. He got us all over with junk having to do with death. We are not a society of death. We're a society of life. You have to live to spread the glorious gospel. Not just to take whatever comes down the pike. I curse death in the name of Jesus. I demanded, back up. Loose the people's minds in the name of Jesus. In Proverbs chapter 2, verse 20, or chapter 22, verse 6, it says, train up a child in the way they should go, and when they're old, they won't depart from it. We're two to two and a half generations removed from training up our children. We have no clue what to train them up in. The TV is what's training our children. The internet is training our children. The cell phones are training our children. A liberal media is training our children. Liberal teachers are training our children that know nothing about God. God is despised anymore but you know the time is short we're going to have to go back to training up our children 
Well, number one, you train them up on the Word of God. Number one and a half, you teach them John 3.16, for God so loved the world hmm, that he gave his only begotten Son. Whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but shall have everlasting life. You train up your children in that nasty old word called honor. Honor your father and your mother. It's the first promise of life that you would live long upon the face of the earth. Now, let me tell you something about honor. And I want to talk to the young people and maybe some of the older ones too. You honor your mother and your father whether you agree with them or not. People say, well, I, I don't understand the concept of honor. See, the concept of honor is this. A man stood up with an old violin trying to auction it off. And the people looked, just the old beater. The bow was all beat up. The bow was kind of hanging off the threads. And the guy says, fool, give me $5 for this old violin. And nobody raised their hand. He said, who will give me $4? Who will give me $3? He says, look, i got to get rid of it today at this auction, $2. And an old guy came from the back of the auditorium, and he stepped up on the platform, and he took the violin, and he shook the bow twice, and he played Amazing Grace. How sweet the sound. And as he played it, the Spirit of God fell on the congregation. And they looked inside the violin and it said, Stradivarius. And the people went, oh, that's honor. Who give me 20,000? One hand. <laughs> Who give me 25,000? Another hand. You see, honor is something that's on the inside of you. You decide honor. You make a choice to honor your father and your mother. If your mother was a drug addict and a hoe, you still honor her because she's your mother. Now that might sound hard for church, but you know what? The church has gotten too politically correct. We got to teach our children how to honor. You know, in a society today, it's very uncommon Uncommon, not common, uncommon for a child to have a mother and a father in the same house at the same time. We don't have that anymore. We got to teach our children to walk in truth. That's the love. You know, the scripture says the love of God is shed abroad in our heart by the Holy Ghost. It starts when you're a child, but a baby needs love. Did you hear me? A baby needs love. When does it need love? From the time it's in the womb. From the time of conception. A baby needs love. A child needs love. I, I, I dealt with a lady one time and, 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 and uh, uh, she was telling me her story. You know, some people you don't just get to lay hands on. They got to tell you their story. And she told me her story and told me her story and told me her story. And it was bringing tears to my eyes how nobody cared for her. Nobody loved her. Even her husband had dumped her for a, a, a younger woman. And I'm going, oh, my goodness, this is so terrible. Lord, you got to do something here. And I asked her, when did this happen? She said, at 37. I said, what? She said, in 37. I said, you mean 1937? It was just as real to her. The pain was just as real. The hurt that she carried was just as real as if it had just happened. We have to train our children about love so that does not happen. You have to get on the phone and call your kids and tell them, look, I love you. And you don't say, I love you even if you are no good scoundrel. 
Come on now. Or worse. See, we, 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 tend, we, we tend to think that only stuff is happening to us. But stuff is happening all over. I don't care how far down the food chain you are, how up in the mountains your food chain goes. There is pain up there because the devil is up there. If he ain't up there personally, his demons are there, okay? Yeah. I've known too many rich people that committed suicide. You know, I don't care rich, rich or poor. When you suck on a 12-gauge, it's messy. And it cures nothing. We have to teach our children faithfulness. How to be faithful. Can I say something about being faithful? Show up to church. It's not that hard. <laughs> I mean, the pastor has to show up. He shows up day in and day out. Two are here. Four are here. Oh, 12 are here today. Most of them his family. Faithfulness. Give honor to God. We always want God to give us something. We pray, give me prayers. Lord, Lord, I need, I need, I want, I want. My name is Jimmy. Take anything you give me. If it ain't nailed down and ain't no strings attached. You know, we don't realize that the Bible is written to a bunch of farmers. They call it technically an agrarian society. It's a bunch of farmers. Why a bunch of farmers? Because there's a principle in farming that says you put seed in the ground and it grows and it produces. That's a biblical principle. You put seed in the ground and it grows. Well, you know what? I just give my love. That's good and you've been getting your love. But you need some money. So you're going to have to put some money seed in the ground to get some money seed out of the ground. Oh, I went to meddling. Let me get back up here. This is what you have to teach your children. You have to teach them diligence. How to stay after it. Stay. Well, you know, I mean, I'm just so hurt because of what they said. I don't even know if Jesus loves me. Why don't you stop it? Be diligent. Get out there and push through. Push through some hard times. You know, I talked to my, my boy last, last night, and, and, and I've taught him some of these things. And he, he was on a fire crew working up in Washington State. And he said they came to he and this other guy, and they gave them an assignment. And kind of laughed when they gave it to him because they know they couldn't do it. They gave them the assignment of rolling up the hose that they used in the fire. Two and a half miles. He said, okay. They come back four hours later, they were sitting on a box. So they said, couldn't do it, huh? I said, oh no, there it is right there. Diligence. You know how you roll up a hose that's two and a half miles? One loop at a time. <laughs> One loop at a time. One loop at a time. How do you grow in God? One scripture at a time. How do you go up the ladder? One step at a time. And they even say, how you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. You know? That's all you have to do. People say, well, you know, I want to be used of God. Well, raise your hand and lay your hand on somebody. Well, I laid my hand on him and nothing happened. I remember when I knew I had an anointing. I knew it. I had six cancer patients in front of me. Six of them. I laid hands on all of them. Five of them died. Oh, but we got one. <laughs> and we rejoice over the one. Because if I hadn't have been obedient, all six of them would have died. Well, next time I did it, only three of them died. And it's getting better and better all the time because of diligence. You go after it. You don't stop. You don't quit because it don't work out. But it just didn't work the right time. I found an amazing thing about my car. If I turn the key and go, nye, 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 and it don't start, you know what I do? Let go of the key and go, wow. 
I don't understand this. Pat the foot on the gas a couple of times. No, no, no. There you go. Forget all about it. I was diligent. Suppose I stopped first time. <laughs> Suppose your kids stopped the first time. Teach your children to believe. Believe. Believe what? Believe what God is saying. Believe. Believing is a choice. You find it in John 20 with the Apostle Thomas. It's a choice that you make to believe. Now, the uh, 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 devil, in his subtlety, brought in a great saying that everybody knows. I'll prove it. Seeing is not so. That's deception. No. Believing is taking the word of one that said something and believing them because of who they are. Like if I say, in my hand I have a wallet, and in my wallet I have $100, you have to believe that Dr. Tom has $100 in this wallet because of who he is, not that you have seen the hundred dollars. Now, once I go like this, secret pocket, I'm gonna find it. I know I, know I got one in here, brother. <laughs> once I go like this, you see what it is? Everybody see it? Hundred dollar bill, right? You don't have to believe it. Do you understand? You don't have to believe it now. You know why? It's there. It's a fact. You have to believe it when you can't see it. When I said it was in here, based on my integrity. That's the way you have to believe God, based on his integrity. When he says, it's my will that none perish but all come to repentance. It's my will that you be healed. It's my will that you prosper. That's when you believe it. Not when, well, you know, when I get a new Cadillac and I'm living on the top of the hill and George is up there with me, then I'll believe. No, you won't. <laughs> Got nothing to do with believing. When you say, I believe I'm on top of the hill because God said that's where I was, whether I see it or not, that's where I am. Amen. I hope this is helping you. Am I running over time, brother? Probably a little bit, huh? I'm not too bad yet? Not too bad, okay. <laughs> you know, as a pastor, I will tell you some of the things that I've had to go through, and I tell you of me, that way you can't criticize that because this is me, okay? Years in the pastorate, raising children, I had to stand in my pulpit, the man of God, and explain to the congregation why my daughter is pregnant out of wedlock. Okay, that was pretty bad. I got through that. I humbled myself and did it. We got the first one. Guess what? It happened again. I got to tell the congregation. It happened again. I got to tell the congregation. It happened again. I got to tell the congregation. It happened again. I got to tell the congregation. It happened. You think I ain't taught her nothing? You know, this don't happen through kissing? Come on. <laughs> I had to go tell him again. I had to deal with drugs and alcohol. And I had to tell her, I said, you know, darling, you did not learn this in my house. A lot of the stuff your children are doing, they didn't learn in your house. But what did they learn in your house? Did you train them up in the way they should go? So when they're old, now that's where the rub comes. What is old? I don't classify me as old. 
You said you pointing to your wife? Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> I mean, Peter, you got to be old. Look at your hair, brother. <laughs> when they're old, they won't depart from it. My daughter, when she was 49, and she has two daughters, she had gone missing. We didn't know where she was. We didn't know if we were dead or alive. I prayed such prayers as, Lord, listen, give me some words so I'll even, at least know if she's dead or alive. We finally got her back. Oh, incidentally, she's doing great now. She, she's saved, full of the Holy Ghost, operating in her gift, going on with God. Everything's good. But she had to say such things as, Mom, Dad, I am so sorry for what I did to you guys. I wanted to say me too, but I didn't. <laughs> but see, now she has two daughters. Not one daughter. She got two daughters. Whoa. And I got one grandson, and guess what? Moving right along. When my wife and I were in our 40s, we adopted three of my daughter's children rather than have them go to the state and become a ward of the state. And the reason for that is my daddy always told me when I was little, he says, you never let the government take your blood. You make the sacrifice. They didn't have all them cool sayings, you know, man up, step up to the plate. No, you make a sacrifice. I ain't had a clue what he was talking about until I took these three kids. I got a white one, I got a black one, and I got a Mexican one. <laughs> all, all I needed was an Oriental. I didn't want to ask. I would have had my own rainbow coalition. <laughs> so I adopted these kids. The youngest one, from the time he was six weeks old, he gave us F-I-T-S in all capital letters. FITS! He had problems in school. I mean, he's a brilliant kid. He would not do the right thing. I mean, I got to go and explain and try to cover for him. I, I remember going to the school because he had been accused of picking up rocks and breaking windows on the school. I knew he did it. <laughs> but I'm still his dad. So the principal's going off on me like I did it. I said, you know what? I didn't do it. And she said, huh? I said, I didn't do it. I said, but I do want to ask you a question. Whose rocks went through the window? She said, huh? I said, who's rock? Where did you get the rocks? Well, they were laying on the... It was your rocks? <laughs> so it must be your fault. So, we got out of that one, kid. <laughs> I got him out of that one. Next thing, I'm, I'm spending a whole week in school. I said, don't you know, I got 21 years of school. I don't want to go to school no more. I don't want to drive past the school anymore. I go to school with him. I sat in his science class every day for a week. I just sat there. I didn't participate. I asked one question. And when I asked the question, the teacher looked at me and said, huh? <laughs> now, I just so you wonder what that question was. He was explaining light going through a prism and showing a color spectrum. And he was explaining to the kids and he had them come up and they were showing, well, you know, uh, I went out and I used the prism and I got two colors. Yay! Good for you. How many did you get? Oh, you got two? Oh, good for you. I mean, you got three colors? Oh, wonderful. I said, why don't you stop it, man? He said, what? I said, whatever happened to Roy G. Biv? He go, who? I said, Roy G. Biv. He said, what's that? I said, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. I said, that's how you remember the colors. 
red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet. I said, Roy G. Biv. He goes, huh? I said, never mind. <laughs> so I'm sitting in the class. Finally, on Friday, the test came. He's passing out the papers. I said, well, give me one. I said, I sat here all week. I'm worthy to take the test. <laughs> I knew more than they did, and they sat through the class. They were participating in reading the book. I just sat there every day. I think I got an 87 or something on the test. Better than my kid. Well, we finally got this kid through school. He didn't want to get his high school diploma. He wanted to be a class A idiot. So to do that, to qualify to be an idiot, this is what you do. You don't honor your mother and father like you're supposed to. He went and he stole all of my guns. Except one. He stole my Winchester. He stole my 22-250. He stole both of my Smith & Wesson Model 59s that I carried when I was a deputy sheriff. He stole all of my wife's rings, the good ones. Not the costume jewelry, the real stuff. He took it all. Had a one carat solar tear, ain't found that yet. He stole my jet engine. He stole my tools. He went on and on and on. And my wife was getting fed up. And she says, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? I told her, I said, honey, the only thing I can do is I got to outlast him. And I would say, Lord, help me. Help me, Lord. Give me grace, Lord. I said, because if I react, I will unplug his head. <laughs> the thought came to me more than once, but I recognized the voice of the devil. <laughs> Finally, I was sitting at my desk one week, and it just a thought came to me. I can't say it was the Lord. I got up, and I looked in the cabinet file, and I saw my one gun I had left. I had a 45 caliber pistol. And I just looked at it. I had bought it in 92 and I fired it one time. Put it back in the drawer. A week later, I'm sitting at my desk and the Lord said, go check your pistol. Now that's a weird thing I would think for the Lord to say. But I went and I looked and sure enough, the box was empty. I went, oh, man, being a deputy sheriff, I knew, hey, I got to report this thing within 24 hours of finding it because that's the law. And I called my son in and I said, you know what? I got to report this because it's the law. I said, I know where it was because I saw it between this period and this period. I said, so I'm going to report it, but I'm going to put your name on it because none of your friends have been here. So I'm going to associate this with you. I said, unless, in three hours, I got my gun back in my hand. Three hours, I had it back in my hand. He walks in, walks over to me, throws my gun on the sofa. I breathed hard. I said, thank you. Uh, incidentally, you don't live here anymore. We packed his stuff. Well, he showed me. He called up his sister or his half-sister in Oregon and Asked her to come and get him. He had lived with her. So she drove down from Oregon, her and her boyfriend, picked him up, and they went to Oregon. And I said, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> I thought that was the right thing to say at the moment. Got up there, and problems erupt. What problems? Well, my granddaughter is living with her boyfriend and this wayward son, in uh, a place. That's all I'm going to say. And the boyfriend and my granddaughter get in a fight, and she leaves him. He calls her up and says, you come back over here to me now, or I'm going to beat up your brother. So he's in the bed sleeping. She said, I ain't coming. He goes in and jumps on this kid while he's sleeping, beats the tar out of him, beats him bloody, just mangles him, and they won't let him get out of the apartment, so got him kidnapped too. 
Finally, I get a call, four o'clock in the morning, Dad, can you help me? Who is this? Well, and he tells me the story of what has happened, how he's gotten beaten up. He's in the police station, and he had to run down to the local store and have this guy reported and all of that, and the police are out looking for him, and he's so-and-so, and I don't know what to do. I'm going to tell you something. In Newport, Oregon, they ain't got shelters. You know, in Redlands, you go, yeah, that's where, where, where's the shelter? I'll go live in the shelter. I ain't got none of that up there. I don't know what I'm going to do, Daddy. <laughs> And I said, why are you calling me? I'm 800 miles away, dude. Well, I don't know who else to call to help me. And I'm thinking, why are you calling me to help you? And the Lord said to me, do the right thing. And I said, yes, sir. I said, well, look, you stay put. Don't go anywhere. And I'll see what I can do. I called around, called around, called around, called around. Nothing's more desperate when you're calling friends and can't get them. When you're calling people at high places, you can't get them. And I finally called one of my spiritual sons in Spokane, Washington. And he says, Doc, if you can get him up here to me and he will submit, I will get him into a discipleship program. He says, that's the best I can do. Make a long story short. This boy went to the Dream Center, submitted for a year came out of the dream center, fired up for God, wanting me to send him messages, calling me to find out what I preached. Who is this? <laughs> well, see, what I did was I walked in love. I walked in forgiveness like I was supposed to. But you know what, beloved, it won't easy. But look at the things I had to teach him. I had to teach him how to walk in all of these things. Who am I not to do them also? Are you with me? Now, he comes out, he goes from the Dream Center to Job Corps. He gets him a trade. He says, while I was up here, I saw they were offering, I could get my GED, so I got my GED, Dad. I said, oh, you got your GED too? He says, yeah. Next thing I know, he says, Dad, I'm, a, a, I'm student of the year at Job Corps. I said, well, good for you. Now, they're telling him, they're going to take him to Seattle, and he's going to paint aircraft for Boeing at a mere $47 an hour. I said, now, I said, when you start getting your abundance, I said, you're going to take care of your mom and dad? He says, you know I am. He said, as long as I'm alive, you got a place. I will always take care of you, and I'll always take care of my mom. Why? We trained them up in the way they should go. And when they're old, they want to point them. Beloved, take time not only to pray for your children. Talk to your children. Lay hands on your children. When they're sick, lay hands on them. When they don't understand something, lay hands on them and ask for the mind of God to come upon them and to come upon you. Ask God to bless your children. Speak highly of them. And when something is bothering you, grab your lips Shut your mouth, don't say it, and pray to God. I hope I'm helping you. Hallelujah. I got one other thing I'm going to pray about before I leave. Anybody with cancer, I want you to stand. Anybody, you're diagnosed with it. Anybody? Just stand up. Stand up. If you got it, stand up. Just, you don't have to come down. Just stand where you are. Anybody? You got cancer. They told you you're going to die. Anybody else? I'm coming to you for a reason. See, God said he would come to his people. Now, you foul spirit, I curse you in the name of Jesus. And I command you to leave this precious woman. Woman, I command you to be made whole from the top of your head to the soles of your feet. I demand you fear not in the name of Jesus. I pronounce you will live and not die in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah.
Now, before I turn this back over to Pastor Don, I want to get in your business. Is that okay? <laughs> you don't know how to take that. <laughs> well, you see what I mean. I'm, I'm from the era when I grew up, they gave altar calls. And, uh, you know, well, you may not know, but I'll tell you, in the church today, there's a great falling away. And you go to the average church, half the people that used to come, they're not there anymore. But here, I want to take time to let you know that Jesus wants your whole heart and your whole life. He don't want just part of you. He wants all of you. He wants 100% of you. Uh, I'm told all the time, well, pastor, you got to understand, uh, I'm, I'm a good person. Uh, that's wonderful. Good people go to hell. Only saved people go to heaven. You must know this. Amen. A lot of people think, well, I'm a Christian already because I'm an American. I was born in a Christian family. You know, my mama told me I was a Christian. You're not a Christian. Some say to me, well, you know, Dr. Tom, I go to church all the time. Because you go to church doesn't make you a Christian any more than sitting in the garage makes you a car. The Bible talks about those that have a form of godliness. You know, you're very spiritual. You just might be religious. You don't have to be saved. God wants people who are saved. You know what to do, but you don't do it. Say, so, well, how can, I, how can I tell if I'm really saved or not? Or if I really got saved back when I thought I did. When I raise my hand, how do I know? Have you produced any fruit in your life? Can you hold your tongue? Are you making an effort to live for God? Are you in the same turmoil as you've always been and you've digressed and got worse? Is your marriage on the rocks? And you're pointing the fingers the other way. You know, people know how to point nowadays, brother. We used to point like this. They point like this now. They got nothing pointing back at you. See. God wants all of you. If you are not living for the Lord, if you're not doing the things you're supposed to be doing, if you have never made Jesus Christ the Lord of your life, knowing that he is alive and he wants all of you, this is your opportunity. This is how I do it. I don't want you to bow your head. I want everybody looking around. Because, see, the reason the churches are so sparse is we've been sneaking people into the kingdom, and as soon as any pressure comes, they sneak out. So if you want to make Jesus Christ the Lord of your life this morning, I want you to put your hand up, and I want you to keep it up. If I'm talking to you, put your hand up and keep it up, because I'm going to count it. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 11, I want everybody to come forward. I want you to walk the aisle with your eyes open. Walk the aisle with your eyes open. Now, for those who would say, you know what? I know I should have gone up there. I should have raised my hand, but I was embarrassed. I'm giving you a second chance. If that's you, come on up. Come on and get in this company here. Anybody else? Okay, join hands. Let's see and make sure I got everybody. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. No, I'm missing somebody. Who am I missing? Who didn't come? Who raised your hand and didn't come? Somebody raised your hand and didn't come. Come on. Okay, you want to live for the Lord. You want to give him your whole heart and your whole life. You're going to make it real this time by his grace. Okay, say this. Jesus, come into my heart. Be my Lord, be my Savior, I choose to live for you. I believe that you died and you rose from the dead. And when you died, you carried my sins. I'm sorry for the sins I've committed. And by your grace, I won't commit anymore. 
But Jesus, I thank you that you rose from the dead. And you're seated at the right hand of the Father. And I rose with you. I thank you for your righteousness. I make a choice this day to live for you. I call you my Lord. I call you my Savior. I am saved. In Jesus' name. Okay, everybody turn loose one another. Turn around. Look at the congregation. You great cloud of witnesses. This is your brothers and your sisters. Pastor Don. Well, let's thank the Lord for what he's doing here. Praise God. Thank you, Dr. Tom. Pastor Peter, would you come on up? We're going to receive a love offering for Pastor Tom Slayton. Ushers, would you hand out envelopes? Make your check out to Redlands Christian Center. And all of this will go to continue this ministry, which is bringing healing and hope to our generation. Amen. What an amazing time this morning. Amen. I believe that these moments are, are, are designed, pre-organized by God in order to stir us up. We get so stuck in the ordinary and, and, and the simplistic things in life, but, you know, faith is a radical thing. Stepping out in faith is an important thing. Matter of fact, the Bible says it's required that a man be found faithful. So God is looking for faithful men and women that are going to surrender their hearts to God. Now, how do we honor God? How do we love God? How do we honor the house? How